Welcome to week 7. Uh, in this week, we will be looking at the mechanics of composites. Uh, for that, we will start with describing the 3D stress strain relations in the material. Uh, but in this specific video, we will be focusing on uh, 3D stresses and strains, meaning we will try to give the notations for the stresses and strains and then show what is the relation for stresses and strains for a very generalized material. So, when we talk about mechanics of composites, we really need to focus on the lamina, the laminate and the structure. Because if we look closely, what are the actual building blocks of a composite? So, the building blocks of the composite are the fibers and the matrix materials. So, when we combine them, we get the laminate. So, in this lamina, previously we mentioned there is a UD meaning unidirectional lamina or BD meaning bidirectional lamina. So, in both of them, we do have these continuous fibers and then the matrix uh, material to hold them together. So, first we need to understand what is the mechanics of the lamina because then once we have a clear understanding of the lamina, then we can move to the laminate where we said laminate is simply a stacking of uh, individual layers of lamina. So, once we stack these layers together, again we need to understand the mechanics of these laminate. When I say mechanics of laminate, we want to understand for a given applied load, how do these deform, the lamina and the laminate deform. Or in other words, if we know the deformation, we need to be able to uh, tell at what loads we can achieve uh, a targeted deformation or deflection. And then once we understand these laminates, then we are in a better position to design composite structures. So, but again let us see, if you are focusing on the lamina, there are two aspects we need to be focusing on. One is the micro mechanics and the other is the macro mechanics. So, as the name says, when we say micro, we are looking at from the micro level of a lamina. In the micro level, for a lamina, we have both the fiber and the matrix material. So, which means we take the properties of the fibers, we consider the properties of the matrix and then use this information to estimate what are the properties or how will the lamina behave. So, this is micro because now we are assuming that the lamina is heterogeneous, meaning the individual fiber is homogeneous or the matrix is homogeneous, but since we are mi mixing both of these materials, we are now looking at a non-homogeneous material. So, that is why we need to look at uh, how to predict or estimate the properties of these lamina starting from fibers and the matrix. This will be covered during the micro mechanics of lamina, where we discuss the fiber plus the matrix. And later, we will see that though it is good for us to be able to predict the effective properties of a lamina, for us to go forward, it is good to have these effective properties. Meaning, so in the macro mechanics, we are assuming that this lamina is a homogeneous material, which has some effective properties. And once we know these effective properties, how do we see the relations between the stresses and the strains? That is what we will discuss in the macro mechanics of lamina. And once we understand the, both the micro and macro mechanics, later we will move on into the laminate, which where we will discuss the macro mechanics of the laminate. So, there too again we will assume that the laminate is a homogeneous material, which means that it has some effective properties or average properties. These average properties we will try to derive based on the information we get from the stacking sequence and the properties of each individual layer. That is what uh, we meant by discussion about the macro mechanics of the laminate. Uh, essentially, we will be focusing on one theory called as the classical laminate theory. Uh, 
So once we have a better understanding about the mechanics of the lamina and laminate, then we are well prepared to uh, move into the design of uh, composite structures where we again use the mechanics of the laminate. So this should give you an overview of what are the different aspects of the mechanics we need to know about composites. But moving forward, what we will focus first is the macro mechanics of the lamina. But even before we discuss about the macro mechanics of the lamina, we need to cover some <coughs> basic information about how we uh, deal with the stresses and strains starting with a 3D material. So once we start looking at the 3D stresses and the 3D strains, we will also look at what is the relation between these stresses and strains. So even before we uh, jump into the composites, we will start with a more generalized material which is an anisotropic material and starting from there we will see uh, based on what assumptions we are uh, arriving it into composites and later we will see from composites we can make further uh, assumptions and take it down even into a simple isotropic material. So we will now start uh, discussing about the macro mechanics of lamina. So we just mentioned that here we assume that the lamina is a homogeneous material though in reality we know that it is composed of the fibers and the matrix and once you consider these two it is a non-homogeneous material. But for our uh, mechanics uh, applications it becomes easy for us if we assume that the lamina is a homogeneous material and then we use the effective properties which are coming from the matrix and the fiber. So for this before we uh, move into or uh, start discussing about the lamina, let us see uh, what are the two extremes of the material complexities we see. So one of the simplest of the materials is the isotropic material. So the classic examples are these aluminum and steel, we assume them uh, to be isotropic material. What, what do they mean? It means that the properties are the same in any direction in the material. So if you are looking at a particular point in the material and then you are looking at one specific direction uh, from that point, we see that the properties do not change whether uh, with the change in the direction. And these properties are effectively two independent properties. or two independent elastic constants is what we need. So with two, if we know two of these elastic constants which could be the elastic modulus, the Poisson ratio or the shear modulus, one of it can be, uh, two of it can be used to describe the behavior of this isotropic material. But the other extreme is a generalized anisotropic material. Where we say that uh, if you are focusing at a point, the properties change with direction, which means uh, unlike isotropic materials where we are able to describe the material behavior just with two independent constants, we cannot do the same here. Here we need lot more number of elastic constants to completely describe the behavior of the material. So we are saying that uh, the properties changes with direction. So now that we have seen the isotropic material and the anisotropic material, from this if you are now uh, discussing about the composites, we see that it is neither uh, as simple as the isotropic material nor as complex as the anisotropic material, means it is somewhere in between. So we are saying it is not as simple 
as isotropic materials nor as complex as anisotropic materials. Because in the composites we do see there are some symmetries which we will uh, take advantage of so that the behavior of the composite can be described with uh, least number of elastic constants. It may not be as less as 2 as in the isotropic materials, but definitely not as much as the uh, unknowns in as in the anisotropic material. So, given this perspective of where our composites uh, are placed between this isotropic and anisotropic material, we see that we should be able to define the relation between the stresses and the strains. But let us uh, look at the definition of the stresses and strains and the notations we use for representing the 3 D stresses and the 3 D strains. So, we will start with the state of stress. I am sure all of us are aware of an infinitesimal element. Essentially, what we are doing is we are focusing our attention at a specific point in the material. So, at that point, we are trying to understand what are the stresses acting. So, what we see here is a cubic infinitesimal element at that point of our interest, and the directions 1, 2, and 3 are three mutually perpendicular directions which defines the faces of this cube. So, how do we define stress? The notation we use is sigma i j for stress, but here I need to define what is i and j. So, i represents the face or the plane on which we are uh, discussing the stress about. So, this is the direction of normal two plane. So, usually we define the direction of a plane by its normal. So, the perpendicular direction to the plane that should give you the direction of the plane. So, this is the first subscript i and the second subscript should give you the direction of the force acting. So, let us see uh, what it means. Uh, first, let us focus on this phase, which is a 2 3 plane. So, because uh, it is parallel to the 2 3 plane, we call it as a 2 3 plane, but how do we define the direction of the normal? We define it by direction 1, because the perpendicular to this phase is along the coordinate 1. So, now let us see on each plane we have three stresses. So, one perpendicular to the plane. So, let us say here it is sigma 1. The reason why we start with 1 is because this defines the direction of this plane and what is the direction of the force we are looking at again in the one direction. So, it is sigma 1 1. Now, uh, looking at this arrow, we should write it as sigma 1 because the first subscript represents the plane the plane is still uh, 1 here, but now the force is along the direction 2. So, we write it as sigma 1 2. Similarly, here we start with 1 representing the plane and 3 representing the direction of the force or stress here. So, what we have seen is on this particular plane we have shown 3 components of stresses sigma 1 1, sigma 1 2 and sigma 1 3. Now, let us apply the same thing for a different plane. Here we are looking at a plane parallel to 1 3. What is the direction of the normal to this plane? It is in the direction 2. So, here to start with we will write it as sigma 2 representing the plane and then the direction is along 1. So, it should be sigma 2 1. 
uh, for this it should be sigma 2 for the plane and 2 for the uh, here I should correct it. So, it is pointing in the direction 2, so it is sigma 2 2, here it is pointing in the direction 1, so it is sigma 2 1 and here sigma 2 for the plane and for the direction 3. The same thing I can quickly write for the third plane just to complete this exercise. So, this should start with sigma 3 representing the plane and the direction of force is 1, sigma 3 2 and sigma 3 3. So, essentially we are able to show the stresses acting on these three phases. Similarly, one should be able to write the stresses, act, stresses acting on the other three phases as well. But now let us see how many components of stresses are we looking at. So, we are looking at uh, three components of stresses on each of these planes and none of them are repeating. So, in total there are nine components of stresses or nine stress components. So, if you look closely, we see that some of these uh, suffixes are the same. So, meaning that when we are talking about sigma i j, either i and j are equal. When both i and j are equal, such as in sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3, we call them as normal stresses. Uh, the examples are sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3. But if i is not equal to j, that is when we call them as shear stresses. So, the examples here are like sigma 1 2, sigma 2 1, sigma 2 3, sigma 3 2 and sigma 1 3 and sigma 3 1. So, what we see is we have 3 normal stresses and 6 shear stresses. So, in total we have these 9 stress components to define the state of stress in a material. So, meaning that if we know these 9 uh, stress components, now even if I change the orientation of this cube, I should be able to find out what are the stresses acting on the new orientation or the each of those planes in the new oriented cube. That is what we meant by the state of state. So, similarly to the stresses, we can also write it for strains. So, the first strain we can represent it as epsilon i j. And here too again it is the same definition saying that I represent uh, the first subscript represents the plane on which we are discussing and j represents the direction of the shear. So, here too when I and j are equal we call it as the normal strain. And when I is not equal to j these are called as shear strains. Unlike stresses, there is a distinction between engineering strain and a tensor strain. So, epsilon i j, we call it as tensor strain. And gamma i j are called the engineering strain. So, let us quickly look at what is the difference between the tensor strain and the engineering strain. So, let us say we are looking at a coordinate axis and then we are looking at a small uh, infinitesimal element again. Let us say this element takes the shape of a square and after applying loads it takes a new shape which I will show with dotted lines. So, let us say 
from the square it changed the shape to a rhombus as seen here. Then how do we define, uh, define the shear strains? We look at the change in uh, this particular uh, axis and then say this is epsilon 1 2 uh, where we assume that this is directions 1 and direction 2. And similarly, this edge rotates by an angle epsilon 1 2. But if we look at this uh, corner, initially it is 90 degrees and both faces are rotating by epsilon 1 2. So, what is the actual change or the total change in this shape? The total change is represented by the engineering strain gamma 1 2 which is epsilon 1 2 coming from the bottom face plus epsilon 1 2 coming from the left face. So, we call write it as 2 times epsilon 1 2 or to write it in general we say gamma i j is twice epsilon i j. So, this uh, bear in mind is what we are using only for uh, shear strains. For the normal strain we go ahead with the tensor strain definition which is epsilon i j. Okay. So, how many uh, strain components do we have? Similar to stresses here too we have 9 strain components. of which 3 are the normal strains which are epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 3 and then we have 6 uh, shear strains which are epsilon 1 2, 2 3, 3 1 and then epsilon 2 1, epsilon 3 2, epsilon 1 3. So, this should give you us uh, the components of the stresses and strains where we said for a more generalized material looking in the 3D at a point there are 9 components of stresses and 9 components of strains. Now, let us uh, see what is the relation between these 9 components of stresses and the 9 components of strain. So, we will start our discussion with an anisotropic material which is the more generalized form of a material. Later we will see based on a uh, few assumptions we can make we can uh, consider any of the materials like isotropics and composites will can all be uh, derived from this anisotropic material making some uh, few assumptions. We start our discussion by showing that any component of the stress sigma i j can be written as a function of the 9 strain component. So, here f can be any nonlinear function. to start with. But then, uh, so we know that the behavior of the materials is linear or non-linear, meaning the relation between the stress and strain can either be linear or non-linear depending on the material we are working with or the range of uh, stresses or strains we are looking at. But in this course, we will be focusing on linear elastic materials. So, considering linear elastic Now, we will say that uh, f is a linear function So, once we consider f to be a linear function I can write the relation between stress and strain in terms of this uh, c was where sigma i j are the stress components 9 stress components and epsilon k l are the uh, 9 strain components. So, here i j k and l all go from 1 to 3. So, all these subscript can take any value be from 1 to 3. So, ineffectively I can write this as I can replace the uh, k and l with summations because as you can see they are repeating twice. So, we have a k here as well as here and the l here and here. So, these are like in Einstein notations if you see that there is a notation which is repeating twice we consider a summation. Uh, 
Now, let me write it as a summation. So, now we write it in terms of summation of k goes from 1 to 3 and l goes from 1 to 3 with a summation. So, to for us to get a clear idea about what this summation means, let us focus on one particular stress component. Let us say we are looking at sigma 2, 3, which means i equals 2, j equals 3. How can we write this summation as? So, it should be C i j k l. So, C i and j we already know is from 2 to 3, so we write it as 2, 3. So, for k and l we need to go from 1 to 3. So, let us start with k is equal to 1 and l going from 1 to 3. So, 1, 1 epsilon k and l, k I have chosen as 1 and 1 plus again i and j remain the same, k will remain the same, but l we are now moving from 1 to 2. So, this will be epsilon 1, 2 plus c 2, 3, 1, 3 epsilon 1, 3 plus. Now, we will move from uh, i j will remain as 2 and 3, but for k we will move to 2 and then again l should go from 1 to 3. So, these are epsilon 2, 1, Now, again uh, i and j remain as 2 and 3 and k goes to 3 now and l starts from 1 to 3. Okay. So, the reason uh, we have written or expanded this summation is to show that for this one single component of stress which is sigma 2 3, we have 9 components which are summed up and you can see this takes care of all the 9 components of the strain, but with each of these components you have a constant which is pre multiplied. So, this says we have 9 constants just to define one component of the stress. So, if we continue it for the other components of stress, how many components of stress do we have? We have 9 components of stress. So, each of these stress component will bring in 9 constants to for a linear combination with the 9 components of strain. So, let us see how we look at it. So, uh, here we have 9 components of uh, stress and 9 components of the strain. The way to look at it is so, we have written all the stress components as a column vector with 9 components. Similarly, for the strains we wrote it as a column vector with all 9 components of strain. So, then we can come up with a square matrix of size 9 by 9 which is 81 components to relate each of the components of the stresses with the strains. So, now this C i j k l what we are seeing now here is it is a collection of 81 elastic constants. So, when we are discussing about the generalized Hooke's law, where we are talking about linear elastic material for anisotropic material, to relate stress and strain we need 81 independent constants. Okay. Just looking at this, we see that uh, requiring 81 constants to, do to describe the behavior of a material is a large number, but uh, we do not need to be worried about it right now, because most materials have some sort of symmetry, which means based on that symmetry you can reduce these 81 constants to a manageable number, like in isotropic materials it is just 2, for composites we will see later it is either 4 or uh, 9 depending on whether we are looking at 2D or 3D and for other materials too we can make uh, some assumptions to bring it down. So, before we move on, uh, so the stresses sigma i j and the strains epsilon i j these are actually second order tensors. 
and C i j k l as you can see is a fourth order tensor. Okay. So, what we have achieved till now is to show the relation between the stress and strain for a most general anisotropic material. Now, let us summarize what we have discussed in this video. We first started by saying that what are the different aspects we need to look at when we are discussing about mechanics of composites. We said we need to discuss about the mechanics of the lamina, where we discuss both the micro mechanics and the micro mechanics of the lamina. And then we also need to discuss about the uh, mechanics of the laminate, where we said we are interested in the macro mechanics of the laminate. Specifically in this course, we will be focusing our attention to the classical laminate theory. And once we have this understanding about the mechanics of lamina and the laminate, then we can use this information to go and look at the mechanics of uh, composite structures or to design the composite structures. Later we discussed uh, in greater detail about the macro mechanics of the lamina, where we said we will be looking at, uh, we will be assuming the lamina to be a homogeneous material. So, we are focusing on the effective properties of the lamina. But before we went looking into the mechanics of the lamina, we said we need to have a clear understanding about how to represent the stress and strain and to know what are their components. So, we started by uh, representing the stress as sigma ij, where we said it has 9 components in the 3D. And similarly, for strain epsilon ij also it has 9 components. And then we also discussed about the normal and shear stresses as well as the normal and shear strains. We also looked at what is the difference between an tensor strain and an engineering strain and we said both of them are related by this factor of 2, where one, uh, where engineering strain is twice the tensor strain. And lastly, we showed that uh, using the general Hooke's law, we can relate the stress and strain for an anisotropic material. So, we have seen that it needs uh, 81 independent constants to completely define the linear elastic behavior of this anisotropic material. So, with this we will conclude this uh, video. Mm -hmm.